Lee. Thank you, Nora. Well, I'm very, very happy to join you via this method. Ah, I welcome you to a very important conference. Um, they may need to move on that end. The um, problem of biocomplexity today is among the most important problems facing the world, particularly related to forestry resources. Um, we're facing the possibility of very substantial climate change that is adverse to all of us. If we don't protect our forests, uh, that will have major consequences for all of us. Uh, and it's not simply protecting the bulk of forests, uh, just forest extent. It's protecting the biodiversity in forests so that they are able to support a variety of ecosystem services beyond that of just providing timber. I'm not downgrading timber, but uh, the diversity of plants and animals and uh, variety in forests, particularly in Mexico and Latin America, is immense. And if we're not careful, we could lose it all. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about institutional diversity while we focus on biodiversity. I am afraid that some of our efforts to save biodiversity have led to a reduction of institutional diversity. If you take some of the biodiversity reserves that have been negotiated in the capital cities of our countries, sometimes the process is for someone in a national government to sit down with a set of maps with a potential funder. And the funder might be an NGO or another international organization. And they discuss where a new biodiversity reserve might be located. They draw pictures on the map. Sometimes then it is declared as a new biodiversity reserve, but the people living in the area who have some that area for a long, long time do not know that others have declared it to be a biodiversity reserve. They discover it uh, a year to two years later when an international office is established, a few guards are put on place, and they're evicted. And so sometimes the very people who have protected us and its biodiversity for, if not centuries, find themselves to be considered outlaws and no longer able to work with their own forested area. And a new institution is created and imposed, but it has a general name like Biodiversity Reserve. And what our 
research all over the world has found is that when institutions have very general names, you cannot predictably, uh, you cannot with accuracy predict what consequences there will be. So we find some government protected and owned forests to be in very good condition and others to be in the shambles. We find some government owned forests that are not protected for biodiversity but are government owned that are in good shape and others in shambles. And we find some community managed forests that are in excellent shape, contrary to the tragedy of the commons theory, but not all. So we need a much richer language for those who have studied bio complexity and biological systems you are very interested and aware of a language system that is nested. So you have a broad uh, notion of a particular ecological system. Then there are communities within that system and sub-communities, sometimes uh, down three or four levels. And it is those sub-concepts sub that are frequently essential when we're going to talk about protection of biodiversity. What are we protecting? We're protecting having a multiplicity of ways of having an ecosystem live. Well, to protect that diversity of living ecosystems, we need a diversity of rules that fit those systems. So the size has to be related to the particular ecosystem. The rules have to be related to use patterns that fit that ecology. Where we have annual production cycles, one might have some form of annual or every two years or every five year harvesting. But if the cycle is 25 years or 50 years or 75 years and you harvest every two years, you have destroyed it. So simply harvest rules have to fit a local setting and they have to fit how big the system is, how many different groups might use it, what are their ways of monitoring, what are the symbols they use for um, honoring people who do well, as opposed to those who cheat, all of the cultural and ecological factors that affect the performance of that system need to be involved when we design the institutions, not drawing boundaries on a map. So th this is a big challenge. We now have a database with over 250 forests in it around the world with colleagues in Mexico who have been varying in the field and done excellent work and in Bolivia um, uh, and in Guatemala, uh, in Thailand, uh, in Nepal, in India, uh, in Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya, and we are doing some studies in Indiana and up in Michigan West. One of the very interesting things that we have from that large 
International Forestry Resources and Institutions Data Program is that the if you want one variable that is most important in protecting a forest and letting it regrow, it is whether the users themselves, the users, monitor the forest and each other. So many times when communities have a long-term interest, they rotate being a guard, and someone from the community uh, does a pass through the outer borders or through the trails once a day. Uh, other times they don't have a person who is really appointed, but everyone who is in that forest is watching to be sure that it's used appropriately. This strong statistical relationship is contra to a good deal of the established theory that the people who use and manage a resource will not put time and effort into that effort and put into governing and managing a forest. But what we find is when people have a long-term interest so they do, they might not be full owners, but they know there are harvesting rights they have for some products from that forest into the future. And they begin to have trust that others are following rules, then they themselves tend more to conform to the rules and norms that they've agreed on. And the monitoring is the way of reinforcing that. So um, having a neighbor tell you, oh, I thought you knew we were only going to harvest on the weekends and never during the Monday through Friday. Well, uh, that could have happened by error. You forgot or you thought it was the weekend. It could have happened because of an unusual family need. But what happens when someone calls your attention to the fact that you're not following the rules is that you know that others are paying attention. And if others were to break the rule, they would also be challenged. So that monitoring is a very key process that keeps a system going over a long time and enables uh, users of resources who are living in the area, using it, using the diversity, really invested in it to help manage and support it over time. Well, I share those thoughts with you as a way of discussing diversity, both biological and institutional. You won't read very often about the diversity of monitoring rules, except in some of our research. But I hope that we can get the topic of building rules that are well fit to an ecological system and enabling to occur in a reasonable low-key way will become part of the literature that we all are reading in the future. And so now I would be very happy to take any questions and uh, look forward to uh, some exchange with you and learning uh, some of your puzzles. Thank you very much, Eleanor. I think uh, if you don't mind, we will... Uh, probably ask the audience uh, to raise some comments or questions, let's say three in a row, and then uh, I will pass on your the, the microphone to you, if you agree with that. Okay. Uh, well, I'll, I'll get a piece of paper and write down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, creo que podemos, por favor, para que se vean 
Les ruego que me, que me... No sé si quieren en español, puede ser en español. Yo voy a tratar de traducir y si no voy a pedir la ayuda de alguna gente que está aquí que, que puede tra, eh, tra, ayudarme a traducir. I'm going to try to translate those uh, questions that are in uh, Spanish, Eleanor, and uh, but uh, maybe some will be in English. But uh, I'm ready to uh, receive some of uh, the questions. Sí, uno ahí, mira, Rocío. Ahí, ahí, Rocío. Eh, hola, ¿qué tal? Mi nombre es Manuel de la revista Teorema Ambiental. Despacito. Eh, Manuel Hernández comes from a, a periodical. Eh, mi pregunta es, eh, quería saber su opinión acerca del mecanismo de red que se está impulsando ahorita de cara a la COP16 de, de Cancún. What, what do you think about the red plus mechanism that no. will be brought to the COP16? That's the first question. ¿Dónde? No me dijiste que había otra pregunta por ahí. No, no, ella no es una pregunta, ella no tiene pregunta. No, no, ella me va a ayudar. Eh, eh, Susan is going to help me translate in case I need. Is there any question? Oh. En español, yeah. If you'd like, I'll answer the first one while others are thinking of questions. Great, great, do it. I am quite concerned about red. I think there could be excellent outcomes, but we have to be very careful about how it is operationalized in practice. <coughs> Pardon me. <laughs> God bless you. Um, thank you. <laughs> If someone who is thinking of very clever ways to make money is able to include an application for uh, preserving uh, some forest that they just planted as a plantation and they destroy indigenous forests uh, owned by indigenous people in the process, the net result is somebody who is very manipulative earning lots of money and biodiversity being less. There can be ways of doing this, but I'm very concerned given there's a very large amount of money and speed and all of this. Under those circumstances, we have to be extremely careful. We need to be monitoring carefully those projects that we hear about so that these arrangements that are uh, strategic but not performance enhancing are caught early and we get officials to establish mechanisms that really do reduce emissions and uh, reduce uh, deforestation and degradation. Uh, it's just So again, like my hesitation about the answer being uh, government protected biodiversity reserves. Some people now see red as the answer. And it could be very positive if done carefully. If we can give funds to people who have protected forests for a long time so that they can continue their positive practices and not be tempted by efforts to cut them down for timber, that could be positive. But unfortunately, 
there are people in the world who want to take the opportunity to make a lot of money. Public officials are very busy and they can't get out and inspect everything. And if uh, they see an opportunity, they sometimes will take it and we will be worse off. So it's just a word of caution. Thank you, Elena. Any other questions? Yes, there is one other question. Please, one? your name. Yeah, par parate, por Hello. favor. Hello, Dr. Ostrom. Very, very nice to see you. Francisco Chapela from Oaxaca, Mexico. Uh, I, you, you mentioned that uh, there is a, an interesting relationship between biological diversity and uh, institutional diversity. I think it's very, very important concept. Uh, but we have in Mexico uh, a tendency or a problem with governance uh, uh, systems. You know that in Mexico, uh, violence is growing. Uh, we have some places in the country where you cannot go safely there because uh, there, is, there are um, traffickers and, and smugglers. So it's, it's, uh, there are places where you have no governance or you have a very bad governance there uh, by one side. By the other side, uh, there is a tendency in Mexico uh, where the government is trying to have just a big police, a big police uh, in all the country. Uh, there are initiatives to, to disappear municipal police, police uh, and also state police. Uh, the tendency is to try to have a, a big national pol police. So I think that that, that uh, doesn't mean uh, precisely uh, institutional diversity. And, and uh, I have a fear that uh, perhaps we, we will not be able in the near future to preserve our institutional diversity and that will have uh, consequences in our national patrimony and in our, our biological diversity as well. So what do you think of that? Question for policy development in Mexico. Thank you. Thank you. And very nice for me to see you also. Uh, I have enjoyed some good discussions with you in the past, and you raise a very important question. Uh, I would oppose having only a national policy related to forests and ecosystems, as well as having only a national forest protection police for this. I am not opposed to there being national police, but they should not be related to the problem of sustaining ecosystems with their huge diversity. Uh, the problems faced in an epivite zone uh, in the mountains of Oaxaca are quite different than in some of the broad, flat areas where you have semi-desert forests. Sustaining a semi-desert in a, um, a very high forested area, those are entirely different problems and take creative ways of thinking about them that are entirely different. And if you have only a set, one set of rules and one police force, one, they will be very stretched. So the police can't be out checking on things and what's happening and they then are frequently strangers. So uh, local people may not trust them. They may not trust local people. I'll have to uh, mention a delicate problem. They may not be paid very well. And what we have found around the world is when officials are from a high agency, have very little local connection, and are not paid well, <clears throat> they do take bribes at a higher level than when 
local officials <coughs> are involved. Uh, the advantage of local officials is they have some real attachment to the area and to seeing it preserved as opposed to someone who is from uh, 2,000 miles away or an entirely different thing or doesn't even understand the local. There's just, this is, you know, if I were buying before your government, I would strongly testify against turning this all over to the national government. And especially given the experience in Mexico where you have such diversity and high performance in some of the states. So there are people from all over the world who have heard about the community forestry efforts in Mexico being among the most successful in the world. I was just interviewed this morning by someone writing a big article for The Economist. And he wanted to get my view of um, forests in Oaxaca and other parts of Mexico. And I had to be honest with him and indicate that there were not perfect for community forests in all parts of Mexico because they're not perfect forests of everywhere in any country. But that what I had observed were local forests governed and managed in ingenious ways that were preserving biodiversity and uh, helping local people get better roads, better schools, better education, and not just having a few wealthy people get a lot of income. So I hope that you are able to convince your government not to do that. Uh, we have now uh, another question. Could you please, uh, Spanish or uh, English? I can do it in English. Okay. We'll see. Name, please. My name is Barbara Ayala. I'm a postdoctoral scholar at the Institute of Biology at UNAM. And it's for me a great pleasure to be able to be here and great opportunity for young people like me to, to see you here today. And my question, um, well, it seems that at a local level, it would be easier and almost more natural to build these rules that would match the complexity of um, eco ecological systems. However, I think that at a national level, it seems that it uh, gets a lot more difficult to monitor and to, to manage um, the situation, especially for countries like Mexico with high levels of corruption. So I was wondering, um, so what kind of institutional changes we need to see in order to couple these local and national of natural resources? Thank you. Coupling or nesting uh, institutions at multiple scales is among our big challenge because people think about the government, think then national. And I'm trying to get a conception that is different into the way we think so that we talk about governments and we could either use the term polycentric governance, which is one we've used here, polycentric, P-O-L-I or P-O-L-Y centric, uh, or federal, or nested. And we do need large scale. We need uh, court systems that are bigger than local communities, that if there is a conflict in a local community and the conflict resolution mechanisms in that area are not sufficient for really effective conflict resolution 
or somebody has uh, committed a crime and stolen timber, one needs to go up a level to a court system that is bigger and can then be more, quote, objective because the people involved are not directly involved. And sometimes you need to be able to appeal to a national government to get new insights and new ways of doing things. So having a court system that is bigger and nested is important. Having accounting mechanisms that are from a local government to a state government are very important. Frequently you don't need detailed accounting to the national, but you need some from a state to a national. And uh, having meetings then of officials from diverse states and communities who meet together and talk about the problems they're facing is another strategy for moving up scale and learning. So sometimes you have a very imaginative way developed in one community and how does anyone else hear about it if there are no ways of communicating what are we learning and why does this rule work here in a good discussion about why that might work in a tropical dry forest and not work in a uh, tropical wet. So the, it's how we get away from this thinking that it's only local or only national. Uh, and as ecologists and biologists, you should understand that. Because do we talk about the ecology of Mexico? The ecology of Mexico? <laughs> Does that make sense? Uh, we can talk about the ecologies, plural, of Mexico and their diversity and their richness. But I would like us to talk about the governments when we're talking more generally. But then there are specific times we want to talk about the government of Mexico City as contrasted to the government of Oaxaca City. Uh, then we can be precise. but. I get very nervous when people talk about the government when they mean the national government as if that's all there is. I hope that helps a bit. Eh, quiero recordar a nuestros eh, participantes virtuales que se pueden hacer las preguntas en español. I'm just uh, remind our virtual participants to send their questions in Spanish. We will translate them. So we have another question. Eh, at uh, good afternoon, Doctor. Uh, my name is Emilio Godoy from the news agency IPS. Um, what do you think about the recent uh, ecological certifications that have been created to secure the origin of the timber? Do you think that uh, they have worked? Thank you. Uh, I would not be the right person to answer that because I don't have expertise and I have not checked on it. It's a very good question, but I, 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 I do a lot of other empirical research, but that's not one I have studied. So I'm sure there are people in the audience who have uh, good information and that you can share it uh, during your conference. Thank you. We will have a panel uh, talking about uh, forest uh, questions, and I think uh, the question might be posed to them, be answered by them. We have uh, Paco Chapela here with us, who is dedicated to that uh, particular uh, issue. So we have another question, please. Uh, my name is Silvia Giorguli uh, from El Colegio de Mexico, and I have two very brief questions. 
Um, you started your presentation talking about the social impact of um, uh, environmental programs or policies that are usually not considered. Um, I would like to ask to what extent the local impact, this local social impact of environmental policies, considered or incorporated in the mitigation and adaptation strategies to face climate change. And um, my second question, well, um, <coughs> your, your discussion is parallel to that discussion on collective action and development, and it reminds me a little bit of Robert Putnam and making democracy work. And uh, the lessons you're talking about usually depend on the level of organization or the capability of organization at the community level. So um, my question is, what are the lessons to be learned from these positive experiences you're talking about in the case of communities that do not have that level of organization that, uh, that usually the posit these positive experiences have? Thank you very much. Um, the, um, let me turn to climate change. I, that's a very good question and one that I've been now doing some writing about. My argument uh, related to climate change is that we have misspecified the models so that uh, we stress that our individual or community action has externalities, but we have only one in the model. If I reduce the uh, amount of uh, timber that can absorb greenhouse gases, uh, that produces a benefit uh, of income and an externality to the globe. And I argue that there are many things that we do at the individual, at the family, at the community level that have externalities for a smaller scale as well as the... So if we take just simply uh, individuals bicycling more uh, than or walking, that has a very major impact on the individual and their health and reduces uh, greenhouse gas emissions. If we have buildings that are individual or community and they're not well insulated, uh, we are using more heating. Um, of course, in Mexico, most of the time heating is not as important to you as it is to me here in Indiana, but um, air conditioning is. And so if you have a poorly insulated buildings, you will uh, spend more on energy to air condition during the warm time. If you insulate better, you can save money at the individual family or enterprise level over time. You will save a lot. And uh, there are also benefits at the global level. So what we need to be thinking about is um, the social benefits of a variety of activities that we can take that will make a difference for us, our communities, our regions, and the globe. And uh, I'm working with the local mayor here in Bloomington to work on some new activities in terms of new tree planting, some new insulation, a variety. In fact, I have a meeting uh, coming up uh, on exactly that question in a few minutes. Um, so that's, I think, the first question. Uh, the second was looking at some of the work of Robert Putnam and others on um, social capital and uh, collective action. And uh, I did my, um, uh, my Nobel uh, speech uh, focused on that largely. And it is now published in the American Economic Review in June. Um, and um, it would be nice if we could translate that into Spanish. We'll have to see if that can happen in the near future. But I am stressing that when we gain various communities at diverse levels, very small to very big, and we develop monitoring rules and capacity to make our own, that we have the capacity to make our own rights, um, 
the um, and uh, we have ways of making sure that the duties that we have are matched to our benefits so that there's equitable rules. Those are the kinds of systems that tend to have high performance and do well over time. I hope that begins to provide an answer. Thank you, Eleanor. I think uh, we are going to to look at the American Economic Review in June and uh, maybe this to all our participants. And uh, I will uh, ask uh, Silvia, who was the uh, lady who made the last question, can translate it and publish it in our uh, periodical in, uh, in uh, El Colegio. Uh, we have uh, two more questions. Eleanor, are you all right with the time? Yes. Okay, we have here one and one other question. Thank you very much. Um, but, uh, so far, economics and uh, environment, has there's a divorce there. Do you think uh, eventually uh, there's a way for, uh, for them to meet instead of crashing as today? Um, is there something happening globally that you can say it's already a tense in terms of the economics and the environment. Thank you very much. It's an honor. Uh, thank you for that excellent question. Uh, yes, um, the International Association for the Study of the Commons has economists, historians, political scientists, water engineers, foresters, it is a genuine interdisciplinary association. We did have a excellent meeting uh, several years ago in Oaxaca with people coming from all over the world. This year, the international meeting will be in India, in Hyderabad, in early January. There will be a regional meeting, by the way, in late September, early October at Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona, and hopefully some colleagues from Mexico would be able to come to that. Uh, it is, I think, September 29th to October 1st. It's in that range, Arizona State University. Um, that is interdisciplinary um, arenas like that of associations are very important for bridging uh, disciplines and getting uh, people who are formally trained in economics seriously interested in environmental questions. There are now some journals that, again, cross uh, ecological economics and other major journals that are trying to marry uh, these fields. I was just at an international meeting of the Society for New Institutional Economics uh, and there was definitely an interest in environmental questions. So uh, things are evolving in a very positive way. And uh, I think we can't continue having disciplines with such separation. It's important that we find ways of bringing those conversations together. Uh, we have the last uh, question, please. Hi, Eleanor. Uh, it's an honor to have you here among us. Um, my name is Santiago Lobeira, and I represent, I'm in the communications and business sector. And uh, I sometimes feel that here in Mexico, Mexicans were losing the up to create a lot of jobs out of, you know, um, we have a lot of land where we can plant trees. We have a cheap labor, and we have a lot of sun, which is a, a lot different from other countries in the world. So my question, or... I guess it would be if you have any words of advice for the government or for the uh, business sector in how we can create the incentives to start investing more money into the, the forestry sector and start you know, building jobs and creating jobs and uh, companies that start you know, creating buffer zones for the primary forest rather than just cutting down the, the trees and you know, selling the, the wood. Thank you. Very good question. Um, let me try one coffee. Uh, some uh, countries in 
uh, Mesoamerica, uh, Honduras, and Guatemala have been doing quite a bit of shade-grown coffee. And uh, that is one area where there can be considerable income and you can take vacant land, not indigenous forests, but land that is already vacant and try to uh, work with foresters as to uh, what uh, trees would be the best to plant and then how to space it so that you can plant coffee at the same time or other short-term uh, uh, plants in the immediate future so that one might be able to have a, a one or two year horizon, a four or five year horizon. Um, and um, the other thing that can be done is to plant uh, or uh, orange and grapefruit and other citrus orchards. Uh, that doesn't get our biodiversity up, but um, uh, citrus is always a very valuable product, and it has the advantage of trees that can be um, helping on um, the uh, whole problem of global change. So there are lots of, quote, products that can be developed with uh, planning where you are thinking of some parts of it being harvestable and other parts being uh, the way we are uh, uh, reducing greenhouse gases and emissions into the atmosphere. And um, uh, I'm sure there are others in the audience who will have still many more ideas than this. But there are ways of doing exactly what you're pointing to. And good question. Thank you, Eleanor. I think uh, we have been really privileged to have you uh, here, at least virtually. Uh, the image was excellent. Uh, you look uh, wonderful from this side. And uh, of course, we are absolutely proud of uh, you uh, being uh, with us. I just uh, want to tell you that uh, we will uh, report to you on the outcomes of the uh, seminar and workshop. Uh, I think we will have a big uh, media coverage and uh, I will try to put together uh, everything that comes out of uh, this session. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank uh, your um, nice uh, lady who was in touch with me, uh, Nicole. Uh, I want to thank her. I think uh, we saw her the, uh, at the beginning, so please uh, say hello to her. And uh, I'm uh, sure that uh, Leticia will uh, uh, send you her uh, a message. And, uh, well, uh, maybe uh, we will chance to uh, have you again with us. Uh, but uh, we will insist on uh, being uh, uh, not virtual, but uh, real. So we, we, we want to have you and uh, shake your hand uh, uh, personally. And uh, everybody will, uh, I'm sure, will thank you very much and a uh, nice uh, day. And thank Thank you. Hasta la vista. <laughs> I look forward to seeing you all. <laughs>